This interview is made possible by The View Conference. I'm your host, Jerry Orris from Kids First, and right now we are with the incredible Sharon Callahan. She is a director of photography for Pixar, but not only that, she was the very first person to ever have a director of photography role in a 3D animation film from her work on A Bug's Life, and since then, her work has been so incredible that she was admitted into the American Society of Cinematographers, and she's the very first person in history to be admitted into the society purely for animation work. Sharon, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you, Jerry. Absolutely. So before we get into the nitty gritty, I think a lot of people are probably wondering what exactly the director of photography for animation job means, because for the audience who doesn't know, director of photography in a live action for films that take place in real life, it's generally the person who's the head of the camera and the head of the lights. Now, there are lights, there are cameras in animated films, but they're very different because of how different the medium is. So can you talk a little bit about how the day-to-day -day is different because it is an animated medium instead of a live action? Well, on a live action set, you probably spend your entire day on location somewhere or on a physical set, and you're dealing with physical things um, like you know, actual lights that you're hanging and smoke machines and things like that. And in the computer, everything's virtual. So, you know, the camera doesn't weigh anything and the lights don't and they're not hot. And, uh, you know, but I think the process is still the same. You know, you're still rigging lights, you're still moving the camera. They just, you know, aren't exactly the same physical things. And mostly what we're trying to do is tell a story with images. And that's the same whether it's in live action or in the computer. I love that. Tell the story with images. I really love that phrase so much. Like I said in the beginning, you were the very first 3D animation director photographer. You're very much a definer of that role. So could you talk a little bit about how you got into that role? What was kind of the beginning of transitioning into a completely brand new role in animation? Well, I, I mean, I kind of stumbled into computer animation by accident um, in the first place because it didn't exist when I went to art school. So I started out in broadcast television and during the time when I was in broadcast, it was the really early days in computer animation. I thought, oh, that looks really cool. I'd like to do that. And eventually I managed to, you know, get to where I was doing commercial work and stuff like that. But I always felt that the, the medium was ripe for being able to tell stories with it, to do a narrative form. So at the earliest opportunity, when Pixar started, you know, the idea of making Toy Story is like, oh, that's what I want to do. So I found my way to Pixar. And then, you know, once I was at Pixar, I was like, well, how can I, you know, turn this into more of a role that's, that's like what a cinematographer does in live action? Because that's what I really wanted to do. I wanted to make images and I wanted to use images to tell stories. So um, I just kind of just kept working my way towards it. And here I am. <laughs> What I really love about your career is that your background in terms of education, it's not really in terms of cinematography, but in terms of more traditional art forms like illustration, still, stills photography. And that's something that's reflected in live action film too. The best cinematographers in history were people who had skills in traditional art forms, not necessarily in just cinematography. So do you think that having skills in traditional art forms matters a lot when composing visual images? I think it does because I think the more practice you have in making any kind of image, it translates, you know, because you learn to judge things based on the rules of composition and whether or not an image is pleasing. And I think it's all just, you know, exercising those skills. Hmm. That's very true. There is definitely some crossover and you're right. The end goal is still the same. You want to create an image that is pleasing, that serves the purpose of what it's trying to tell. That's a very good point. Now, uh, like we keep talking about, you're defining this role and roles are still being created today, you know, especially with this recent increase in virtual reality 3D animation. There's a lot of new roles around that field. So can you talk a little bit about your process for exploring the roles of trying to make this director of photography for animation job and what tips you'd give to younger audiences who maybe want to define their own roles in the artistic industry? Well, I think that uh, always keep in mind that your ideal job or role probably doesn't exist yet. You know, when I was in school, this job didn't exist yet. And so a lot of it is like just staying flexible and, and adaptable and, you know, looking at what's coming up next and what appeals to you. And yeah, the, everything's going to change to be completely different 20 years from now. So you want to be able to, you know, 
develop the skills that translate no matter what the medium is and how things are going to evolve in the future. That's such a great point. It leads me to my next question is that the CG industry is an interesting one. Like when you look at live action, they've been using the same microphones for 20 years. It's There's innovations, but in other places, it's staying the same. But in animation, it's a changing world. It's really changing fast. And just look at Pixar films from five years ago, and you can see that it's changing really, really fast. So what advice would you give to artists to stay on the absolute cutting edge of technology and to understand the newest innovations? I, I think it's staying curious. I think it's, um, you know, having a true interest in the technology and also the art side of things and being able to think outside the box a little bit of, you know, what do you, what can not only can you create with what you currently have, but how can you hook up what you currently have in a new way to do something different or, you know, just keeping an eye on what new technologies are emerging and how that might inform and, and, you know what you're doing i love your talk about the technology and using your creativity to take advantage of that technology and that leads me to uh, my next question i want to discuss you know the job of lighting as well because you have a background in lighting before transitioning to director photography and still in between you have a lot of experience in lighting what i find fascinating is that lighting an animated film you have to follow the same rules as live action where you light for the scene you light for the mood but you also have to work to emulate reality because one of the biggest points of lighting is to emulate what reality looks like. So how do lighting artists balance those two often conflicting forces, reality and the style of the scene? Well, I think that we're always trying to make things our own, you know, and, you know, give it a, a certain kind of style. I think at Pixar too, the other things that are really important to us are creating a sense of authenticity and a and a sense of place and also um, believability, you know. And so I don't think that like we're necessarily trying for realism, especially photorealism, but I think it's it's a certain intangible believability that is, you know, gives the audience a way to relate to it. Because I think just naturally being computer animated, you know, there's a little bit of a distance between the audience and what they're seeing. They can't relate to it in the same way that you can relate to you know, something that's captured in live action on the screen. So you need to create that connection with the audience. And beyond that, I think that, you know, we're not that interested in, you know, sometimes on certain films, maybe we are in photorealism. A lot depends on the director and kind of what kind of style they're going for. And some directors want to be highly stylized. Some directors, because of the story they're telling, they want to create a little bit tighter connection with the viewers. They want just a little bit more realism to it. Hmm. You know, I think your point on connecting to the audience is goes to what a root of a Pixar film is. It's something that stayed consistent. You know, I was watching one of the very early Pixar shorts, and what I loved about it is the animation, of course, it changed a lot, but the fundamental connection with the audience, the humor, the theme, the characters, it's still as impressive today. So that leads me to my question. Do you think that there are some fundamental skills that young artists can develop that won't go away, will never change despite the change in technology? Oh, absolutely. I think that just like I said earlier, you know, being able to create compelling imagery, you know, being able to judge an image and know what can I do to this to make it better and make it the best it can be? What can I do to create a stronger sense of emotion? You know, what can I do to create that visceral reaction with the viewer when they see this imagery? You know, and so a lot of it is just like understanding, you know, at its core, that kind of process of creating images is always going to translate into Indian media. Absolutely. I definitely agree with that. And I think Pixar films show that fact that their artists are first and foremost storytellers and animators and technical artists and lighting artists second. I think that absolutely shows in the work. Now, uh, it's been hinted at and actually a view conference event earlier also discussed this, but the fact that on the technical side, Pixar is transitioning into not physical rendering. And for the audience who doesn't know, there's two things. NPR, PBR, physically based rendering means it looks like real life. It mimics real life physics. NPR, it doesn't. It has a lot more freedom. But on the lighting standpoint, on the director of photography standpoint, how does this change your day-to-day -day job and how does it change the way you can express the imagery? Well, I think that, um, you know, no matter what kind of tools you have, there's going to be certain things that are easier to accomplish and certain things that are harder. And what you hope for when you're making a film is that 
those tools align with the artistic goals of the film. And there's always places where they do, and there's always places where they don't, and you have to compromise. And so I think that, you know, the tools we try to keep as stable as we can, as long as we can, but also constantly um, adding new features and functionality to it. So there's always this kind of push-pull kind of mechanism of keeping things stable and pushing ahead at the same time. Um, but, you know, and we're always trying to add new features for the shows that are coming up into production to make sure that we can hit the artistic goals of the, the show. We're always, well, at least for the foreseeable future, stay in a fairly physically grounded underpinnings of the technology. What we're trying to do more on top is to add enough hooks into the software to be able to make it easily extensible to create any kind of look that you can think of. Um, so I think that, you know, it's just being able to envision what you want to achieve and then, you know, backwards engineer that to figure out how, how to actually get the look mm. and what tools you need for that. You know, I like that uh, you're describing the technology as tools because in truth, that's what they are. You know, they're vessels for the story to go on. And I like your description of that, that it should really fit the story at the end of the day and not vice versa. I really like that comparison. Yeah, although we do learn, like sometimes we actually, you know, learn from technology that informs the story. So it's, it, there's, it's always a little bit of a loop, hmm. but yes, you're right. It's like everything, at, especially at Pixar is very story driven. And I love that. I really love that. Now, uh, aside from the rendering technology, there is also some other technology that's innovating, like Toy Story 4, for example. It had a lot of very advanced phot photographic, I guess you could say, technology. It emulated a lot of real-life live-action techniques in terms of how the cameras work, how the lenses work, even going as far as to say how filters work, which really blew my mind. So seeing that they are kind of trying to converge towards... Uh, more realistic live action techniques, how does that change the job of the director of photography? Well, I don't think it necessarily changes the job. It just, it's again, it's a, expanding that toolkit to be able to reach a broader variety of looks. You know, for that movie in particular, they were very interested in creating, you know, looks that were closer to photorealism than what we typically do. But other shows, you know, it might be more stylizing that look. Like for instance, on Onward, you know, it'd be taking that a lens package and then taking certain aspects of it and exaggerating it to make it more stylized. So a lot of it is just getting the tools actually working. And then it's like, you've got the freedom to play. Mm. That's interesting. That's really interesting. And you mentioned Onward. That brings me to my next question. When people watch Onward, there's a lot of very real life colors in there, just in the suburbia, the city. It, in terms of colors, it seems like it's a normal place. But then you have people who have blue skin, yellow skin, green skin. So could you talk a little bit about how the color theory side comes into play? You know, how do you explore what colors represent what emotions and what colors can best suit the scene now? Because for people who watch Pixar, you can probably notice color is a huge, huge part of it. So can you talk a little bit about how color theory plays into it? Yeah, it, it is a big part of it. And, you know, some of it is um, things that you plan out, you know, like we usually come up with a palette for the film, you know, on Onward, we decided to reserve the color of purple for dad, you know, and anything having to do with him. So it wasn't used as a, a color in the sets or on the characters at all. Um, we decided to go with a very simple primary scheme where we just basically had about four colors um, and different shades and saturation levels of that instead of having, you know, every color in the rainbow. We really wanted to kind of contain it to a certain few specific colors. Um, and I echoed that to some extent in the lighting, you know, taking some of the surface colors, but usually by the time we're getting into the light color part of it, um, you know, it goes beyond that where you kind of set your rules aside and you kind of go with what is the right thing for this particular story moment? What makes me feel a particular emotion in the strongest way. And, you know, a lot of that is pretty subjective. You know, it's, it comes down to what your own personal history has been in the past and memories you have. And, you know, sometimes they're stereotypical, you know, where you've 
you want something cold and gray, you, you know, you make it really cold and gray and it feels kind of depressing. Um, but a lot of times it's not necessarily, you know, what you might think. It might be something completely different. And because it doesn't fit your expectation, it has a very strong reaction in you. So for instance, you know, if you lit a, you know, a scene that was supposed to be, you know, like a dark, disturbing moment and you lit it really brightly and colorfully, it's going to give you a completely different emotional reaction than, you know, if you lit it the way people kind of expect it to be. Mm. So it's, it's always like you, sometimes you just have to try things. You know, we do um, lighting studies, you know, as paintings ahead of time to explore ideas before we settle on to any one particular thing for the show. You know, for Onward, I knew that Don, Dan wanted um, the home environment to feel normal and friendly and, and like when anybody might expect their own home to look like. And then, so then we had a jumping off point for when they started going on to their quest as we could introduce kind of other colors you wouldn't see at home, like the bright green gelatinous cube or, um, you know, the bright red um, drink machine, you know, colors like that, that kind of had a little bit of a bolder punch to them. I love two things about what you said. First, I love the concept of color themes, you know, how the fact that purple was concentrated to the dad and how that played with the story. I love that so much. And it's so subtle, but it has such an impact. And just the experimentation of it too, because uh, like you said, color theory is a very subjective thing. So I'm sure artists who are watching are wondering because color theory can apply in so many different realms of art. What suggestions would you give to them to develop their color skills so they can develop their own color palettes and learn how to experiment with it and apply it in interesting ways? Well, I think for me, it was like just, I mean, I've always been wired to color my whole life, even when I was a little kid. It's like, it's always had a really strong, you know, emotional connection for me. And it's something that I pay attention to a lot. Like I pay attention to light and color. In fact, sometimes I have a hard time turning it off when I want to, because I'm constantly looking around and going, oh, look at that. Oh, I love the way that turquoise looks next to that orange. You know, it's like, I think it's just paying attention to that stuff and learning how to, you know, use it as a, as a tool, you know, how to juxtapose colors, both on the screen at the same time, but also, temporarily over time, like, you know, butting up two shots, two uh, shots next to each other that are different, you know, and how that makes you feel, you know, because sometimes going from something really bright to really dark or really green to really red, you know, it's like, it's the change that has the biggest impact rather than, you know, each color individually on its own. That's fascinating. That's really fascinating. And I love that it reflects the real world and just kind of looking around our environment and seeing what colors combine. Like you said, just seeing how that turquoise combines with another color visually. I just love that it applies to our real lives because for a lot of techniques, it seems like it's only an illusion that applies. But for color, it's the actual thing. It's the actual hues that apply in our real lives. I love that so much. Now, looking at... Go ahead. No, I said, go ahead. <laughs> now, looking ahead in the future, in the real world, the CG industry has done amazing things recently to include people of all uh, ethnic groups, of all genders in the creative process. But of course, there can still be so much more done. So for women or people of all, all walks of life who are coming into the creative process, what tips would you give them? Well, I'm not sure I would give any tips that are, are unique that way. I, I I think any advice I would give would be more general of just, you know, find the thing that you're really passionate about and you want to pursue and don't let anybody, you know, slow you down, you know, just learn as much as you can work as hard as you can. And, you know, the, it'll happen. Hmm. I think that's some great advice. I think that's really good advice. And it shows that, you know, experimentation is absolutely needed. Would you agree with that, that experimentation is needed to find your passion? Yes experimentation and staying adaptable and staying curious. Well, I think those are some great tips and I hope our audience has listened to it. Sharon, thank you so much for talking to us all about your career. You're welcome. Thank you, Jerry. Of course. For our audience, make sure to check out Sharon's many incredible films at Pixar and Pixar's upcoming films because they are still definitely making art and still definitely innovating. 
This has been an interview for the View Conference. Make sure to check out our many other interviews, our many other events, and for more information about our upcoming conference in October, which is happening both online and in person in Italy, go to viewconference.it. That is viewconference.it. I'm your host, Jerry Ors, reporting for the View Conference, signing off. Bye.